In observance of National Mentoring Month, today we're going to talk about the importance of mentoring in the field of psychology and counseling. I'm Maureen O'Connor, president of Palo Alto University here in Palo Alto, California. Palo Alto University is a specialized university. We train counselors and psychologists at all levels of training, undergraduate, master's, and doctoral training. And because of that, mentoring is particularly important. We have strong values and commitments to cultural diversity and to improving the human condition. We're really honored today to have with us one of Palo Alto University's most distinguished faculty, Dr. Ricardo Munoz. Dr. Munoz? Thank you, Maureen. Um, I joined Palo Alto University seven years ago uh, because it has such a strong, explicit focus on increasing diversity in the field and on social justice. Uh, and uh, I've been very happy to mentor students here who share those uh, values and goals. My career, I'm in my 42nd year now as a, as a professor, um, has been focused on serving underserved, doing research, focused on prevention and treatment of mental disorders, and uh, students here really like those kinds of approaches. So. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more, and it makes being president here even better because I get to uh, interact with the students, the faculty, the staff, our wonderful board of trustees, and our community. So what we thought we'd do today is have a little conversation about mentoring, uh, thinking a about why it's so important, how it's influenced our careers to some extent, and how we, go, how we think about it here at Palo Alto University. So I wanted to start off by asking you, Ricardo, to tell us about a mentor that guided you in your personal or professional path. Well, you know, in preparing for this conversation about mentoring, it occurred to me that my first mentor, and probably the most important one, was my mother. And uh, she taught me to read and write. She taught me the four basic operations in math before I went to school. So I learned that teaching can be done in a very caring way. I mean, you know, with, with that, the love that a mother has for, for a child. And I think when I think of mentoring, I try to think of mentoring in the sense of providing caring for the person mm -hmm. who's learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, making sure that the, the mentoring relationship is safe, that men, uh, mentees can feel that they can uh, make mistakes, that they're learning, they're learning, so that then when they perform as therapists, let's say, you know, they can uh, do a really good job. But when they are being trained, they can take chances, and make mistakes, mm -hmm. so they can learn to be even better than, than what they could be. The other thing that she taught me um, is that she gave me a mission. You know, I grew up in Peru, in South America, and uh, we immigrated when I was 10 years old, and before we did, she sat me down and said to me, uh, your father finished primary school, I finished high school, and we want our children to go to university, but we don't have the money to send you. So your father has decided to immigrate to the U.S. where there are many educational opportunities, and when you finish your education, we'll come back to Peru to share what you've learned. So that day she taught me two big things. One of them is that education is so valuable that it's worth traveling halfway across the world to get it. And once you get it, you share it. And I think that's a really important part. And then the third thing that she taught me is kind of an ethical sense of uh, ethical guidance. She taught me about social injustice, discrimination. There was a lot of discrimination in Peru toward the indigenous mm -hmm. population, for example. And uh, so when I came to the U.S. and found racism and discrimination here, it wasn't new to me. And uh, it helped me to build in uh, that sense of social justice in my professional work, which is, again, why it's so compatible with PAU's mission. Absolutely. I think I, I, it totally resonates with me what you're saying. Because, and I think, honestly, one of the reasons I moved into administration, which sound, might sound like the opposite of where you go to do more mentoring, but I felt very much the same way you did, which is that students and faculty, frankly, should we, it is our obligation to find their path mm -hmm. and help them get to that path. And I felt that as an administrator, I could remove some of the obstacles to those paths in a more effective way than I could even as a faculty member. But that drove my, that same feeling of sort of figuring out what your mentee needs, whether it's a student, faculty, graduate student, undergrad, 
and then helping them with a caring approach find their path. You know, mm -hmm. not all students will, right? I mean, they we're going to occasionally have students who who just don't find the right path or don't, you know, don't uh, don't des decide psychology and counseling isn't for them. Yes. And that's okay too. Mm -hmm. But for those who want to go down this path, we need to f to 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 find a way to to allow that. So I think we're we're quite compatible, even though we come at it from different uh, different approaches at the university now. Well, uh, you know, I've also been in administration yes. in years past. I was a chief psychologist at San Francisco <laughs> General Hospital, and I was director of training uh, at the University of California, San Francisco. And uh, I got brought in to being a chief psychologist, kicking and screaming. <laughs> uh, the chief psychologist who was there before me left. And the chief psychiatrist asked me to, to become chief psychologist, and I said no. He came back a couple of weeks later and said, Ricardo, I'm going to offer you this opportunity. You, you can be chief psychologist for six months, and if you don't like it, you can go back. You won't even yeah, have to leave your smart. office. <laughs> and after six months, I was sold. And the reason I was sold is that I was at the table with the other administrators of the department making all these decisions that affected the students, the trainees, the patients at the hospital, mm -hmm. the staff whom we hired, everything. And I, re I was the only non-white person around that table. And I realized that we had to do that. And in terms of mentoring, I think we need to uh, find students who want to be leaders, including yes. administrators. Yes. We need leaders who have those values that we treasure so that they can be at the table and ideally at the head of the table <laughs> right. making the final decisions. Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. Well, you've, you've sort of begun to answer my next question, which is why is mentoring important to the field of psychology and counseling and mental health in particular? Mm -hmm. right. Well, the way that I, I think of mentoring is, uh, again, it, providing tools, something that people can use, providing goals, inspiring people to do something that they maybe they never thought they could do, uh, and providing some kind of standard, you know, ethical, a code of ethics, ethical guidelines, and so on. And in the mental health field, I think uh, particularly what, what you're doing is, is you're, you're really teaching both at the level of teaching therapists or, or undergraduate or master's level students, um, as well as clients or patients. Mm -hmm. You know, part of what you're doing when you're doing therapy is you're teaching yeah. patients or clients how to live their lives in healthy ways, mm -hmm. right? How, how to be able to shape their lives in ways that uh, allow them to reach their goals without hurting themselves or hurting those around them. I mean, that's really... Pretty, pretty, pretty profound. That's what you're doing. Yeah. So if you're teaching, then I think what you want to do as a mentor is to, is to model that kind of teaching, which involves, the, again, the caring. I really like, when I was trained as a cognitive behavioral therapist, one of the first things I was taught was Rogerian interviewing techniques. Mm -hmm. Carl Rogers is one of my heroes. And you know he talks about genuineness, empathy, and unconditional positive regard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. And it connects up to this idea of providing safety in a mentoring relationship. So that when I'm working with a student, the student is allowed to make mistakes, yes, so right? Important. And it's I'm not so going special. to feel that they are devalued by making the mistake. In fact, the students I most like are the ones who make the most mistakes because they are doing a lot of things that go beyond their area of comfort, right? Mm -hmm. So I know they're going to come up with innovative ideas. They're going to work with patients that they are afraid of working with, for example, right? And, and that's, those are the students that I think get, get the most from, from mentoring. Mm -hmm. The same thing with patients. Again, the patient must feel safe in the therapy relationship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they can say things that maybe are embarrassing, and that I, as a therapist, I'm not going to think less of them because they do that. The reason they are there is because they want to better their life in some right. way. And I think that whole person kind of approach is what slightly differentiates mentoring from advising, right? I mean, you could advise a student about what course they should take yes. or what, what path they might take without, that, without being all in in supporting them as a whole yes. human being. And, and I think for me, that's certainly been the thing that I've loved about working with students is just yeah. seeing them thrive, whether they end up in, in our field or not. Most of them do, but um, that's just so rewarding. Yes. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're, you're witnessing human development. Yes. Right? And, yes. And, and, and you have a chance to, to guide the development slightly or to help them 
go wherever they want to go. Yes. You know, not where you want them to go, but, right. but right. where they want to go. Right. Well, yeah. and I do think there are um, there are people who see mentoring um, in as a way to how do, how do I mimic myself? How do I mm. recreate myself? So mm. let me ask you, how, how would you typically describe a mentor? Um, what qualities are important in a good mentor? I think a good mentor uh, must be able to teach the mentee what the mentee wants to learn. So fit is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I, I, I like is when I find students who have the same goals and values that I do because those students are the ones that I can teach the best. Right. You know, uh, and, 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 if you, and if they don't, you, they, it might be better for them to be working with someone else. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think Having that's reluctant really uh, students is not good for right. the student, right. it's not good for the mentor, and having reluctant mentors is not good either. <laughs> right. Right? I mean, if, if you right. don't really value what the student wants to accomplish, it's going to be very hard for you to want to teach them, yeah. and, and certainly to to teach them in a caring fashion, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So yes, so the fit is very important. So tools to teach and that the student wants to learn those things mm -hmm. that you can teach. Mm -hmm. Again, the second thing is inspiring the student that they can do things that they may not have considered they could do yeah. before. That's really important for, for a mentor, I think. And then giving them standards, that's yeah. really important. You know, part of it is called socializing them into the mm -hmm. profession, mm -hmm. which means that as a psychologist, you must be of high integrity mm -hmm. You must, you must take the patient's welfare as the top priority in the relationship. I agree. You know, all those things, yeah. uh, those are things that are very, very important, mm -hmm. I think. And again, the sense of safety, providing a sense of safety within the mentoring relationship. Yes. One of the things I've learned, by the way, is that some of my uh, mentees who become uh, comfortable with me begin to criticize me <laughs> or, or critique some of the things I do. Right. That's when I think I have actually You've accomplished. Them. You've got them. <laughs> yeah, because and if they do it in a caring fashion, they teach me an amazing amount of stuff. And when you have that kind of mutual teaching, yeah. then you've got a terrific relationship. Yeah. It's yeah. that it's that transition point of student mentee colleague. Yes. And that is just a beautiful thing. It is when that happens. Yes, <laughs> I've had mentees who years after I finished working with them have called me up and said. Uh, you know, Ricardo, I miss our mentoring relationships. Would you mind if, you know, we got together once a month? Uh, and, and I love it when That's that happens. Great, yeah. And, you know, sometimes I've done that for years after they've left their official uh, training. I, I had a student um, call me about two weeks ago uh, from the floor of Congress. She was, she mm. is a, cr she was a criminal justice, uh, one of my criminal justice doctoral students, not a psychologist. Yes. But she had organized a hearing, the first ever hearing, for the division of, of women in the Criminology Association. And they did a, a congressional hearing on uh, violence against women. Mm -hmm. And the first person she called at the end of the hearing was me. You know, and she just wanted me to know yes. that she had done it and that, uh, you know, it was it, our work together had led, you know, all of yes. the things you, you sort of yes. hope a mentee would, would, would get. But that, um, the, the, what that showed me was she didn't, you know, she wasn't just a fantastic student and a, she's now a full professor. I mean, she's, she's very accomplished. But the being in Congress and testifying and providing data on a social problem to try to fix that problem said yes. to me that the mentoring worked because it wasn't enough for her to be smart or accomplished or get her you know get good grades or get a job it was really inculcating that that desire to actually change the world for yes. me so that yes. was a that was one of those moments where yes. you just sort of <laughs> and it shows that you have a lifelong relationship with exactly. this person right i mean exactly. the mentoring isn't from the first day they, they sign in to the, they graduate. the graduate. Right. It, 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 when, when you really develop a, a mentoring relationship for real, it continues right. for the rest of your lives. Well, now I've, told, I've just told you about someone that uh, I played a role in. You know, could you tell us a little bit about maybe someone who's, you played a mentoring role in their lives that it would be? Well, you know, what comes to mind is that uh, I recently had my 40th anniversary of being a professor. And uh, I thought, you know, how do I celebrate it? Well, 
by calling my mentees uh, and, and, and telling them, hey, you know, I, I want to celebrate. I'd like to see you again. How about if we all get together and we spend a day together? So, so they came back and, uh, and we spent a day in which I asked each of them for, for 10 minutes to talk about what they'd done before they came mm -hmm, to train, mm -hmm. what they remembered when they were training, and then um, what they've done since then. And I had some uh, trainees come from as far away as Florida to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was wonderful to see them again. And this sense of all being kind of a family, mm -hmm. even though many of them had never seen each other because you know, I trained right, some you know, 40 right. years ago and right. then some 20 years ago and so on. But there was this sense of, um, of shared values. Mm -hmm. They had gone on to do uh, things that affected people, just like mm -hmm. what your mm -hmm. student did, uh, especially underserved people, mm -hmm. people with low power in the, in the community and so on. And they were training, many of them, most of them actually were faculty members too. Wow. And they were passing it on. And it, it, that was a high, I mean, an amazingly <laughs> high day for me, seeing all these trainees and that they still cared enough to come back. What a beautiful day that must have been. Yes. I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall in that, uh, in that event. Actually, a couple of my PAU students were there. Oh, yes, wonderful. Yes. Oh, and, that's and they, great. And, and they also, you know, talked about what it was like uh, and what they wanted to do. And they could see uh, the, the students who came actually were, were Latinas, both Latinas. Mm -hmm. um, and they could see these other Latinas mm -hmm. and African American and Asian women and, and men also, of course, who were now doing these amazing things and, and being able to That's, see these that is so important. models, yeah. you know, of people who were like them and were doing these things that they didn't think they could do. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> Well, and I want to ask you, I know you spoke about your mother and obviously looking back and seeing the, the beginning threads of kind of building your mentoring career, but when you actually get into the heat of academic training and your doctoral program, is, you know, something led you to also move in the direction of, of emphasizing mentoring. Because, you know, many, many people we know in the field, you know, that's not their, their, their strength necessarily. Yeah. So what, what do you think drew you to becoming a mentor once you were actually, you know, in the field and, and heading in a very productive, highly productive research career? Um, uh, well, you know, when I first went to grad school, um, my plan had been to open up an office in the Mission District, which is the barrio in San Francisco where I grew up after immigrating here, so that I could offer therapy in Spanish to the people in the barrio. Um, so I, I went to University of Oregon um, uh, after going to Stanford University where I learned about social learning theory and from, from Albert Bandura, who was my senior thesis advisor. Uh, who, who again gave me these tools and these ideas of self-efficacy and the, the idea that you could, you could help to shape your own life if you learned what affects you psychologically, right? So I, I go to University of Oregon and the first month I was there, I went to a talk at the Community Mental Health Center, a, a board meeting, in which a psychologist gave this impassioned talk on primary prevention. He, in brief, he said to us sitting around the the room there, you psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, you sit in your offices and you wait until people suffer enough to have to come to see oh, you, okay? Oh. What you should be doing in addition to that is going out into the community and sharing what we've learned as mental health providers mm -hmm. so that they don't have to need you. And I was sitting there just about to begin the, you know, five-year PhD program, and here this guy is saying, that's not enough. <laughs> you know, being a therapist is not enough. And I could have just ignored them. I had enough to do, you know, to get a PhD. But I found that idea so compelling that at that moment I had a conversion experience and I decided that in addition to being a therapist, I wanted to help to develop the prevention field. And so uh, I had luckily faculty at, at Oregon who taught me about prevention, brought me into the community psychology field, mm -hmm. and also taught me about how to uh, uh, learn to manage depression using cognitive behavioral uh, ideas. So that, uh, and one of the things I, I did was uh, co-author an annual review of psychology article on prevention, it, uh, during which time I learned a lot about what was, what was going on there, and basically there was very little uh, research on it. So then I, I went to the University of California, San Francisco, at San Francisco General Hospital. I became a professor there, and one of the things I wanted to do was develop this field of 
depression prevention. And uh, to do that, uh, one of the things I, I learned is having postdoctoral fellows and interns mm -hmm. was amazing, Crucial. right? And I was doing my work in Spanish, English, and Chinese sometimes. I, I don't speak Chinese. So um, having Chinese uh, uh, trainees mm -hmm. was wonderful to, to do that. And uh, what I learned is that I could do a lot more with trainees who were dedicated to the things I was dedicated to than I could do on my own. Mm -hmm. And all those, and that's where the mentoring occurred, because then these trainees would you. come in and they would be very excited about doing these things they had never heard about before. And it was just so invigorating to me. And we did this amazing things that I didn't think I could do, but I, I could do them with them. And at the same time I was teaching them, I was getting something. And then the people who were part of our prevention trials, for example, were trying to prevent postpartum depression, for example. And so I'm just going to general, 85% of the women in the prenatal clinics are Spanish speaking. So I, I was forced, if you will, to do my work in Spanish and English, which is what I wanted to do anyway. And so then I was able to recruit Spanish speaking and other you know, African American, Asian, uh, white uh, trainees who were committed to these populations. Mm -hmm. I, I have a trainee who is a Vietnamese woman who is doing work on Spanish speaking uh, prevention of postpartum depression. She's at the jo uh, uh, George Washington University. Wow. Uh, her name is Mimi Lei. And uh, she just sent me a, a video of the Mothers and Babies course, which we developed at San Francisco General, and she's developed more there, that is being used in Africa. Oh, gosh. It's just amazing. It's just a little tiny video that, that you know, shows. So, so it's, it's sort of, it's like mentoring as amplification too, yes. right? It, it, it amplifies everything yes. we do to have, to have the opportunity to bring others along into the work and then that changes the work and the work evolves and expands. And it affects the world. Yeah. I, that's amazing. That's I mean, I used to think that, I, you know, I would have this office and I would see individuals at, in the Mission District, which would right. have been a wonderful way of right, leading right, life. There's right. nothing wrong right, with that. It's, it's an amazingly right. important thing to do. Lots of our friends do. do that and it's very, it's wonderful work. It's wonderful right. work. Right. But I could never imagine that, you know, I could do this and part of it was through mentoring. Yes. We'll probably wrap it up. We could go on for a long, long time. I could talk to you forever about this um, and we'll do some more uh, later, I hope. But I think what we want to think about is, is um, you know, how do we how do we work together here at, at PAU and, and elsewhere to create a culture um, that really supports uh, mentoring? And I, I think we want to, uh, you know, I wrote a chapter with you know, someone you know well, Meg, Meg Bond, one of my wonderful colleagues, and, and Amanda Clinton, two, two amazing scholars. But we were really trying to talk about the idea of social justice mentoring in the sense that we, want to, we wanted to help people not only uh, see the value of mentoring, but see how mentoring itself can also change the context in which we work by moving us toward the values that we that mm -hmm. we think are important. So I don't know. I just love your thoughts about how we can, what can we, what steps can we take to to support mentoring here at uh, at Palo Alto University well, think, and and elsewhere. I think we are already doing a lot in that area. I, I, I think by making explicit the values of mm -hmm. Palo Alto University, mm -hmm. values of the uh, importance of diversity, mm -hmm. uh, our focus on social justice, and so on, that you, you can focus on those things and still be a great therapist, a, a great, great researcher, researcher right. a, a, an administrator, mm -hmm. in, uh, not just an academic administrator, mm -hmm. but also a clinical mm -hmm. administrator, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can, you can become the director of a clinic right. that will serve the populations that we are committed to serving, right? So I think we're already doing that mm -hmm. by making explicit what the goal is. That's good. But I, I think the w one thing that we could do in addition to that is explicitly focus on teaching our, our trainees that you can do that, you can be socially committed and be a terrific therapist, a terrific researcher and so on, mm -hmm. and that you can change what happens out there. Because yes. in many institutions out there are not explicitly committed to what exactly. Palo Alto University is committed exactly. to. Right? So many of our students are going to go to institutions that don't have that commitment as explicitly as we do at least. Mm -hmm and that they can mold that environment, that they can shape the environment by their actions. Right. 
promote institutional change yes. through their own actions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm delighted to have spent this time with you and hope we can do it again, part two, come, maybe coming up later. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>